Let's okay. scooch to the lungs. So now we're going to talk about pulmonary causes of fever. And there's quite a bit here. This is a common cause of fever. And there's yeah. a lot of different etiologies that we have to touch on. So let's jump into it. So this is community-acquired pneumonia. Um, what the source of that pneumonia is when we talk about community-acquired, there's still a pretty long list. We've got the bacterial things. We've got the viral things. And then we have the less common. And these usually come with some sort of risk factor associated with them. You've got the pseudomonas, your MRSA, yeah. which isn't everybody. No. Um, so, so whatever... Where, wherever the, the patient that, you're, that you have in front of you, what their age is, what their comorbidities are, what their recent hit, have they been in the hospital recently? All of that matters mm -hmm. when it comes to figuring out what kind of pneumonia they have. I like this particular picture because it kind of talks about the chest x-ray and what it looks like and then what's on the list for that particular type of pattern. I do like this. Pattern. I kind of yeah. wish, I, these are these clever things I wish I'd thought of. Yeah. I like this one. This is a nice way, now they're showing you a CT scan here, which obviously gives you a lot more detail yeah. than a chest <laughs> x-ray. But you know, when, they, when the radiologist uses certain uh, phrases like ground glass opacities or when you see an effusion, for example, that should bring certain things to mind. When you see a pleural effusion, don't forget about TB. That's on yeah. the list. Um, what is consolidation? What about a cavitation? All of these different types of patterns should bring to mind different types of uh, differential diagnoses. So if they give you the chest x-ray shows X, this might be something that could be useful to you. We talk a lot about atypical pneumonias. What, what is actually in the list of atypical pneumonia? Here are the things you should think of. Mycoplasma is a common one. We classically describe this in young adults as a kind of, they look pretty good walking pneumonia, but they end up having this patchy yeah. interstitial type of pneumonia. And there's a bunch of extra pulmonary things that go along with mycoplasma, the bullous meringitis, Guillain-Barre, uh, et cetera. Chlamydia pneumonia, this is in infants. It can happen in young adults as well. Also described as patchy interstitial, yeah. but again, usually a not sick looking person um, who has, the, the, for infants, they describe the staccato cough and the conjunctivitis, mm -hmm. uh, conjunctivitis, I mean, um, that go along do with that. pneumonia. I mean, when you hear that, it's like, oh, oh yeah. that's what that is. <laughs> yeah. It, it sounds like a woodpecker. And yeah. then the Legionella, which is another kind of category. This is the older kind of males, the v, the, the VA convention yeah. that they're at the you know they're at the hotel and the contaminated air conditioning yeah, the from summer, the water source. It's hot. There's air conditioning going exactly, and, yeah. and they get the low bar infiltrate. Older sickly men. I older love that. sickly men. <laughs> They have a low sodium that goes along with it. They often have GI Actually, symptoms. Actually, that's key. If, that's I were, if I were really writing a important. test, I would put that on there. Yeah. And it doesn't get transmitted from person to person. It mm -hmm. came from that contaminated water source, uh, and that's Legionella. So that's those and are that, Yeah, there's nothing that shows up. Uh, that, that's one of the things you just have to think about because yeah. it doesn't show up on a smear by any – and it's, it's hard to test for. Yeah, that's right. Well, not hard. You have to think about it. Mycoplasma could look a lot of different ways on chest x-ray. This sort of illustrates that. Usually it's patchy infiltrates. One example here where it's not, but that's, uh, that's what mycoplasma might look like. Um, and then we've got Legionella, which is also, again, they got a spectrum of severity. They may right. or may not have all of those things that we list. They could be really sick with altered mental status and the GI symptoms, or they might just have the pneumonia part right. of it. And the thing about chest x-rays is it is, it, it is really hard to tell the organism from a chest oh, x-ray. Yeah, and people sure. often will say, well, it's low bar. It must be yeah. this. And if yeah. it's you know, patchy, it must be that. And the reality is it, it isn't. Yeah. It, it, the, that correlation is not 100% by any stretch of the imagination. So it's just like, oh, there's something there, and we still have to do more information, more searching. Yeah, and don't don't stress out too much about though. You know what? I am not good at reading chest X-rays because no. they're going to have to give you more than that in terms of a test oh, yeah, question. Absolutely. They're going to give you a whole bunch of other clues besides just a chest X-ray to get you clued into to what the diagnosis. Is. And often you don't even need the chest X-ray by right. the, by the things they put in the vignette. You know about the about the type of patient that it is. You can already guess at what they're getting exactly. at. So in terms of what pneumonias could be viral, you know, this is like textbook stuff, but if they had a runny nose and if they had more of a lymphocyte predominance, they don't really have a white count like a bacterial process. Those could be clues that they're trying to get you to think of a viral pneumonia. Multilobular infiltrates for sure, grand glass opacities, okay. But one good point here is we talk about procalcitonin being able to differentiate between bacterial and viral. Turns out, not so not much. Not so much. No, we would love that to be, but it's just not. Just not. Yeah. So bacterial pneumonia, your clues would be this is a very acute onset. This might be in an older patient. They've got some kind of comorbidity. They've got a white count. Sometimes they could even have leukopenia that yeah, might clue yeah. you into it. 
fever goes with it, also with a headache, sort of a, you know, it's a systemic thing. They've got some painful lymph nodes. Maybe they've got some diarrhea going with it. And they've got this kind of socked in looking chest x-ray. That's classically bacterial. And again, unfortunately, wah, wah, your post-calcitonin is <laughs> not going to help you kind of differentiate between Which these is things. actually something they may push on an exam because yeah. I, it is actually, it is used. It's just not used by us. Yeah. It's used up in the ICU to That's help right. them to, to determine when to stop giving antibiotics. Exactly. But exactly. it's not used by us to determine one or the other. Yeah. We'd love that, but it's not, it doesn't work. Yeah. So this is one of those great slides that walks you through all the different organisms. What is the typical pattern that you might see on a chest x-ray? What kind of person could be the type of patient that gets the specific type of infection? Love these types of charts. I do. <laughs> this is perfect for test preparation to kind of go through it. So, you know, if you think of the person who had a viral uh, illness or has IV drug use in their past, that's the person you want to think about Staph aureus in, including MRSA. Klebsiella, that's the alcoholic could be the COPD. They've got the bulging minor fissure. I remember learning that with the yeah, current the sagging jelly fissure sign. Oh, <laughs> goodness, if they give you that, that's just great. Um, anaerobes, don't forget about that. And people who've got bad teeth, they're alcoholics as well. And, often they're, the and you can lobes. smell it. Yeah. That's one of those like, oh, oh I know what yeah. this is. Yeah. <laughs> And then in your adults, if you look on the left, this is the type of patient you're starting with. Is this someone who's outpatient or inpatient or recently been in the hospital? That leads you to think about certain organisms, mm -hmm. and then that leads you to what your antibiotic coverage should Which be. Which is really how we tend to approach patients, right? We, this is, we group them. This is, this is our common out, you know, sort of rubric that we group them into. And if we can throw in these uh, things from the previous slide, that's helpful. But right. this is sort of the general approach to that, that first choice of antibiotic you're going to choose for that group. It wasn't so long ago that the IDSA updated their pneumonia guidelines. So it's been it's been a, a good amount of time that this could be something that's, yeah, that's testable. Yep. And they want you to know what those changes are because it, they hadn't updated those recommendations since a long time ago. Yeah, so it had been a long time. Now, when you have a really sick person dying of a pneumonia, then you really have to do the sputum cultures, the blood cultures. You want to do the whole meal deal and you want to admit and treat for MRSA, pseudomonas, you know, big guns in that kind of um, category. Now, for those people who are out getting outpatient treatment for pneumonia, remember that the recommendations in terms of macrolides have some caveats to yeah. them now. Now you have to think about local resistance levels, and that can influence whether or not macrolides as a monotherapy yeah. is appropriate in your patient population. So your antibiogram is worth knowing. Yeah. Ours is posted on the wall, so we can kind of know what yeah, works. Yeah, you kind of know. Um, Procalcitonin. It's kind of out. You can't yeah. really use that to determine whether or not you need uh, antibiotics or not. We said that is, you know, we can't really say that it's viral or bacterial based on the procalcitonin. So that's sort of out. Steroids also out, not routinely recommended. Maybe if they're, again, they're in that category of dying, 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 you might think about it. Um, but in general, yeah. with pneumonia not yep. being used. And then for the really sick pneumonia in terms of empiric therapy, we're looking at a beta-lactam with a fluoroquinolone combination preferred over a beta-lactam macrolide And I think that's the biggest change for most people is you were in this habit of clicking the beta-lactam macrolide yeah. box. Yeah. And that's probably the biggest change. That's the biggest testable change, I think, as far as where you could stumble yeah. um, if they stick to this guideline, which is what most people have transitioned to the, in their hospitals. Yeah, I mean, as antibiotic resistance is changing, yeah. these are, this really does influence what we do day to day. Um, this is a pretty detailed chart here, but in terms of community acquired pneumonia, again, going off these recent 2019 guidelines telling you in terms of making the diagnosis, you've got your blood cultures, your sputum culture, your procalcitonin, you've got special things like Legionella and pneumococcal urinary antigen, not a routine thing that you would do, but if yeah. they, this was a person that was at risk for that, that's the kind of diagnostic test you would send to look for that. Um, and then if, influ if you're in influenza season, and often if they say on the shoulders of the influenza mm -hmm. season, that would be a time that you'd think of about testing for flu. Um, and then in terms of severity, looking at these, they kind of try to categorize it into major criteria and minor criteria. It's a lot of detail there, but you know, just for your information. And then are they going to be outpatient, inpatient? We'll talk a little bit about these different scoring systems that you can use to help guide that decision. So we've got these severity indexes, and there's several of them out there. These are things that can help you decide how at risk this patient is for decompensating. And so should I put this person in the hospital or not put them in the hospital? And so you can look these things up. You're not expected to know these by, by memory, but to know that they exist yeah. and that these are aids to your decision making. Right, that's one of those, uh, you, whatever you 
I'm going to talk about MD Calc. I have no stock in anything, but yeah. that is something we a lot of us use. And this is just not MD Calc. You just plug in the numbers yeah. and it gives you a score and it explains it, which I think is nice about yeah. MD Calc. It explains to you why that score means what. Yeah. And obviously, vital signs, and we're in the vital yeah. sign module, plays a big role in helping you decide again at what sort of yeah. risk they are. And the other thing about this particular score is if you look at the bottom, there's look at all those tests. Yeah. You don't have to order all those tests. It's just if you ordered yeah. those tests, you plug them in. Yeah. All right. So um, again, based on what you just did in the last slide, this gives you the score and then what their risk in terms of mortality is and what the treatment stat strategy would be recommended based on the risk that category that puts them in. Should they be someone that's in the middle sort of like, yeah, maybe it could be a short stay or yeah. observed for a little bit versus this is someone you want to admit because they've got a lot of things on that right. list. And again, this is one score. There are others available that you that's can right. use as well. Curb 65 is something that some people use. It's just as legit. Yep. Or you could use your clinical judgment. Yeah. But <laughs> clinical the judgment, yeah. This helps to put this into the chart so you have some data. This goes uh, to the question of antibiotic coverage and what should I choose? And so we've got an outpatient category and an inpatient category. We've got the healthy person or we've got the person who's got some comorbidities. And that all ties back to what they're at risk for in terms of etiologies. And so here you have some recommendations about what sort of drugs you might want to use. For a healthy outpatient, just to note, you've got amoxicillin on the list, yeah. which I think we don't commonly use. <laughs> Doxy is on that list as well. And then you've got the macrolide, again, relating to what your resistance patterns are where you, where you work. And then your comorbidities, you're kind of bumping things up. You've got more of the amoxclavulonate. You've got the cephalosporin. Again, macrolide or doxycycline, you're going to kind of combine those things. Or you can go into the fluoroquinolone category. Yeah, and I think most, most of us are avoiding fluoroquinolones if I we can. That's right. So you'll, it'll end up being a two-drug therapy. Yeah. So then if you bop, bop, bop down to the inpatient, we've just talked a little bit about that. But I want you to note there in terms of MRSA coverage, there are some cases where you might want to consider MRSA coverage, but not in everyone, right? No. You have to have kind of a reason to do that. Um, and then you've got your, your, anaerob your anaerobic coverage for aspiration. But remember that you don't want to just routinely add that stuff on unless you've got like a real abscess right. or an empyema where you're really thinking about exactly. it. Exactly. And the, and the MRSA people look sick. I mean, they're, they're, yes. they're not subtle. They look terrible. That's right. So that's the pneumonia stuff that we think about with the bacterial sort of treatment approach. But um, if you work in the right environment, and some of us do, yeah. um, you're going to see tuberculosis. That's right. So and, and don't reality, forget about it. Yeah. And what's interesting is that we see tuberculosis. I, I work in a, in the South Bay of Los Angeles, where our hospital's in the middle of, of some pretty nice places to live. Yeah. And we all shop in grocery stores, and we all. And what's amazing to me is that this is it's just out in public, and yeah. the idea that it somehow it doesn't happen at the fancy hospital down the street from yeah. ours is interesting. So you, everybody really, if you're in an area where you have particularly immigrants, yes. people who've been in jail, um, people who have HIV, those are kind of the groups, IV drug users as well. Those are the exposure risk, um, immunocompromised patients as well. But those are the people that might get this. So and we have a whole screening system that we do routinely in anybody with any kind of pulmonary complaint um, or hemoptysis. We do as for everybody so that we put them basically into airborne precautions. We are now all very good at yes. all kinds of, air of breathing precautions. Better than now. we've ever been. Yes. But, but for <laughs> tuberculosis, we know that that negative pressure room in the mask were vital to keep tuberculosis from spreading. We actually had a little outbreak in our ER uh, more than almost two decades ago because of it got spread in our emergency department. And the symptoms we think about, this is the person with the night sweats. This is the person that has a little bit of hemoptysis, some weight loss. They mm -hmm. may have some extra pulmonary signs like scrofula. They may have a node in their neck. Um, they Often the cough is productive, but a little bit productive. And, and they just have kind of wasting. They just don't look so great. They just look, you know, they just are Consumption. Aren't... Yes, old name? exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Like drop C for yes. congestive heart failure is <laughs> consumption. Exactly right. The workup includes, for us in the ER, is a chest x-ray. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really, vi and just, even just a plain old, oh my gosh, how quaint is that, chest x-ray. Usually it will show you something if you're worried. Now the chest x-ray on this particular picture shows you what's called a gone complex, which is, this person actually is those calcified nodes that they end up from having had tuberculosis. And if you see, if you see a reading that says old granulomatous disease that a radiologist reads, it's usually somebody who's older, who's had TB, who gets these little nodules out in the lung periphery and they may have these calcified sort of uh, lesion, the calcified uh, me, nodes in the hilum. If you think somebody has TB, um, you have enough symptoms to worry you, a chest X-ray that worries you, you don't have to necessarily, if, especially if you think it's just TB, you don't have to treat it. In fact, the, you're going to do sputum, cult, sputum yes. specimens, et cetera, et cetera. There's no reason to treat early on that. There's no magic to that. But public health is a big thing with this. Um, multidrug resistant TB exists. It's scary if that thing ever gets everywhere because it's really hard to treat multidrug resistant TB. We don't want anybody to get this. So this is something where public health gets involved the minute you suspect tuberculosis because they will do things like sometimes admit 
in a negative pressure room until the, the treatment can start and they can basically get a plan in place. A plan in place for this so it doesn't get spread particularly in the home. So TB is something to kind of keep on your radar. And one of the things that really should slam it onto your radar is if you see a lesion in the lungs. Now, it's not usually like this one. This one is right lower lobe. It actually has what looks like an air fluid level in it. If I were to somebody to show me this chest x-ray just out of the blue, I'd say, oh, that person has bad dentition, probably a seizure disorder or alcoholism, and they aspirated. That probably is an anaerobic, anaerobic lung abscess. Tuberculosis actually tends to be more in the apices, um, and it's cavitary. They, it can cause things called, called Rasmussen's aneurysms, where it actually erodes through one of the little bronchi bronchial arteries. That's the hemoptysis we worry about so much. But if that, if that were up in the upper lobes itself, I'd be much more worried about TB. So this, there are several things that can cause these kinds of cavitations. And we can go back to that wonderful slide that Jan had that shows you the cavitation little box that yeah. what, what could cause it. But TB is definitely there, especially if it's in the upper lobes. Now, the other thing that a chest X-ray or a CT scan or your exam, if you do it well, can show you is an effusion. So pneumonia with effusion, the most common is strep. And it's a, actually a paraneumonic effusion with strep. It's not an empyema. It's actually the infection and in strep in the lung can cause just an effusion in the, in the periphery that isn't true truly an infected infusion. It's just a fluid in the periphery. But you can also get this with Staph aureus, H. flu, Legionella, and TB. And Jan mentioned this, especially children. If children get tuberculosis, they frequently get a, a pleural effusion. But think TB, so, and especially HIV positive people, those go together. Um, TB of the lungs, a pleural effusion, HIV, those all go together. So think about that. And this is something that you often will tap it, You'll get it out of there. We'll talk about that when we come to respiratory things later. Uh, but this is something you're going to actually go in there and get. Now, there are other, other reasons that people get effusions mm -hmm. that aren't febrile causing. So everything else listed on this doesn't usually cause fevers. But, well, Borhobs can eventually. But aortic dissection and Borhobs are on the left. CHF, pancreatitis, and hepatitis are on the right. Um, those can, they can cause effusions as well. They're non-infectious um, for the most part. Now... I'm going to take a big old breath because pediatric pneumonia guidelines are long, they are detailed, um, and they're kind of frustrating, to be honest. <laughs> like everything, the IDSA and the PEDS ID Society came out with these guidelines, and they are really long. And I'm gonna tell you what's in it, just in case you need all of this for um, the taking the test purposes, but I'll tell you for real life, there are just a few things that really matter um, in this. One of the things is admitting, and, and, and t this, is, this to me is just not rocket science. Yeah. You know, you've got a sick kid who's hypoxic. And they, I don't um, need a guideline to tell me. I don't need a guideline <laughs> to tell me that. If I'm worried that they have a really virulent organism, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. If, they, if, the, if the kid is not getting cared for at yeah. home, I'm gonna keep that kid in the hospital. Um, and if they're really little, yeah. I'm gonna keep that kid. So that's easy, that part's easy, that's fine. Testing though, I think there are a couple things I like about these, some of these testing guidelines. If the child has pneumonia and looks great, please, and they're fully immunized. Remember, not yeah. immunized, you're gonna worry about things like pneumococcus and, and H flu. But a fully immunized kid, it's not gonna be those things. That It's usually viral. Don't send blood cultures. That's a lot of big Thank waste you. of money. Thank you, fine. And they yeah. actually wrote that. They wrote that in black and yeah. white, red and <laughs> white on the slide. But we can right. actually not do blood cultures. Shocking. Yeah, it's wonderful. Sputum gram stain and culture, well, they want you to do it if you admit, but that's, I mean, that's ID yeah. people, right? They yeah. want to culture stuff. Honestly, yeah. it's fine, order it. Urinary antigens, we know we can check pneumo, strep pneumo and an urinary engines. It's not, and it says immunized kid, don't do it. They don't have it. Don't do it. They do recommend flu testing. Um, and they recommend, and I'll tell you where I think this came from. Uh, back in 2013, when we had really bad flu, it killed kids. It killed kids, preferentially killed kids. And we know that flu in general preferentially kills kids and older people. So I think their low threshold for testing for flu, and we'll talk about tr treating for flu, is because they don't want kids to die. Um, so I'm not sure the impact of all of that, but the reality is they recommend testing for flu and some other viruses as indicated, particularly RSV. Antibiotics are not recommended though, unless you really think that if their flu test is positive, don't, unless you think there's a co-infection with a bacteria, it's not recommended to treat with antibiotics. And if you really have something that makes you think about mycoplasma, so we talked about things like, you know, bullous meningitis plus a pneumonia or, um, you know, anyway, they, that's the main kind of things that you're looking for these kids, then you can go ahead and test for, for um, mycoplasma. 
CBC, you know, whatever. The CBC, I just, I have lost all respect <laughs> for the CBC over my The career. more you know it, the less yeah, you like yeah, it. Yeah, the less you like it. So <laughs> it's, thank goodness it's a weak recommendation, even in serious cases. And then these acute phase reactants, these LD, you know, just send a sed rate or a procalcit, it just don't. It's, it doesn't help you. So th this, just throw it away. It doesn't really help you. So don't use that as the sole determinant. You're using more things together. And then what's interesting is the chest X-ray. If you suspect pneumonia, whoever thought they would write down, you don't need a chest X-ray. Yeah. But they wrote down, you don't need a chest X-ray. If you're going to send the kid home anyway, just, don't do it. Yeah. And the reason for that is that we're just all pretty terrible at reading these things, including the radiologists. They disagree with each other on whether there's a pneumonia there or not. So chest X-ray, they said, ah, not so much. Now, antibiotics. Basically, it's not these kids, if they're fully vaccinated, it's not usually bacteria. It's viral. Mm -hmm. So don't give them antibiotics. Viral, That's a hard viral, one viral. to swallow. It is. That's yeah. tough. And especially if you if someone did get a chest yeah. X-ray and you see a little schmutz in there and it's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, the parents are like, oh, it's That's pneumonia. Tough. It takes some teaching. Um, and honestly, a lot of people just say, I'm going to give it anyway. Um, and to be frank, that's okay. The antibiotic is amoxicillin. Yeah. Again, cheap, works if it's bacteria. That's again, remember, these are vaccinated kids, amoxicillin. That's a, the, the key here. And if it's school age kids, they want to switch, switch to a macrolid. Um, again, that's probably going to end up regional, like yeah. the adult stuff, but that's what they recommend in this particular guideline. Now, antiviral therapy, and we're talking about something to treat flu here. So we, they've recommended you do the flu test in all these kids anyway. If it's positive, they want you to start early antivirals. And actually, even if it's negative, they want you to start antivirals. Now, this is, I think, a bit of an overreach. Um, there's not a lot of data that it does much no. anyway. Uh, but this is a guideline that if they're going to test you on this, I think this is what they're going to want you to know and what to do. I'm not sure this is done, translates out into practice. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm not going to like have true confessions here, but the reality is I'm not sure this is practiced the way that they want it to be. Um, and the reality is if you're really worried about a kid, if you want to admit them because they're unimmunized and they look kind of a little punky or at least obs them, that's fine. That's fine. Um, here's kind of a summary of this, the de degrees of severity of pediatric pneumonia. And the reason this is important is the, the kid that's mild, you know, they're coughing a little bit, they have a little bit of a fever, they're not particularly wheezy, their sats are good, their vitals are good, they look good, they're running around. You're really not going to do much for that kid except they want you to test for the flu. The moderate kid, there might be a little more concerned. You want to send a, a few more tests, they're looking sicker. That's the kid where CBC, maybe you're going to want to check you know, or not a CBC, you may want to check a chest X-ray in that kid. Blood cultures aren't routinely recommended. Um, and then you're going to kind of go based on there. And then the really sick one, we're going to do a lot of stuff anyway. So that one is easy. So it's basically that green group that we're looking at. No chest X-ray, maybe just a flu test and send them home often with nothing or maybe antivirals. And then here's just an, an algorithm to kind of take you through. This is the bottom of that first slide, the slide we just had. This is continuing down on what to do treatment wise to kind of give you a guideline on how sick the kids are and what to do. And I'll let you go ahead and read through this. The, the concepts are the same. And here's the very, very bottom of that that explains all the little numbers and things that go with this. As far as the AAP is concerned and the CDC, as far as these antivirals, basically what they recommend for people who have the flu is to basically start antivirals as early as possible for basically suspected or, un or confirmed. This is now everybody. This isn't just kids. Um, but this is, they rec this is for children right now. We're going to focus on at this, this moment is that severe, uncomplic severe complicated or progressive illness or those at risk for severe complications. If they're young, they recommend treating them under two. If they have chronic health conditions, treat them with antivirals. And again, and I wish I could tell you that the antivirals make a difference. <laughs> I have no data out there anywhere that Skeptic says it business. makes yeah. any difference. It just makes us feel better. We do it with adults too. Yeah. Adults who are super sick who get admitted to the hospital. If it's flu season, we test for flu. We treat with, with the drugs we all know, but there's no data that it really does anything. It's just yeah. making us sort of feel like we're doing something. And the drug that we often use is oseltamivir. If you're gonna do it in kids, it's weight-based and you need to know that. Um, outpatient has weight-based, inpatient has weight-based. So just know that this is the treatment as far as what the approach is. At low threshold, right? They want you to do this in kids that you are suspected of flu, even if the test is negative in a kid, which I just think is crazy. It's I just think weird. it's crazy, but that's the bottom line. And again, our goal in this particular module is to teach you what's out there, but I think real practice, this doesn't translate to most. And then we have one slide to just bring up COVID. Um, if you're taking the test early into the EM cert testing, this will not be on the exam, but this will be a part of our lives going forward, I think, forever. So this is something that you're going to have to factor in. How we factor this into our workups of patients going forward when we get to a steady state, um, we'll see. 
Um, we're all kind of COVID saturated at the moment, so I'm yeah. not going to spend a lot of time on this. We Most of us are well versed in COVID, yeah. uh, but this will be something that as going forward, I think will get factored in somehow into how we do our workups. Yeah, I mean, right now, I think we think, uh, you know, pulmonary and fever, it's all COVID, and we have to remind ourselves that there's well, still and TB there's, and all these other things. Exactly, and I think, that I know, I've, there's a lot of discussion of people who are talking, it's like, oh yeah. my gosh, we didn't even think about, or oh gosh, I had to remember. Yeah, yeah we had an m and recently of a missed case of TB because we thought it was COVID, yeah. which is, you know, just what we're all thinking. So, you know, we'll see how that all evens out over time, but it's a good time to remind ourselves of all the other pulmonary causes as we've just walked through. Exactly, yeah. so, <laughs> exactly. So when you go back to your job today, it might yeah. be all COVID, but when you're at ABEM General, yeah. it's it's going to be a little bit of everything. That's right.